Good evening. Welcome to this special presentation by ThinkTech on fish farming, ocean technology, and the big question of why farm fish. And with us in the studio here this evening is Mr. Bill Spencer, the President and CEO of Hawaii Oceanic Technology, Inc. And welcome aboard, Bill. It's nice to have you here this evening. Thank you, David. I'm delighted to be here. Let's talk about this, uh, before we get into what, what your company does and the new developments, new technology, let's talk about, Bill, the, kind of the, for our, 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 our audience here, what's the big picture about food security and ocean farming? What's happening that makes this such a, such a vitally important topic that uh, you, you need to know about, ladies and gentlemen? Well, as you know, David, everybody loves seafood. In fact, uh, we put love it that, too much. Yeah, put me in that category. That's <laughs> right. And we love it too much. It's healthy for you. It's heart healthy. It's low in fat. It's a great source of protein. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, our ability to uh, produce seafood from the wild is extremely limited. In fact, our oceans have already reached maximum sustainable yield, meaning uh, we can't uh, catch enough fish to meet demand, and uh, the more we catch, the uh, the more the resource is depleted and, in fact, distressed. Is, is that, just for the the people who are uh, watching this program, they go into the market. Is that is that why they, when you go into the supermarket and you look at the prices of of uh, ahi, for instance, it just seems to be always skyrocketing or, or oh, something. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a supply and demand issue, and and as the resource becomes more scarce, the price continues to go up. But there's a food security issue here as well, and and uh, people are surprised to know that uh, the United States imports. 85% of the seafood we consume. 85%? 85%. It's our second largest natural resource import behind oil. And uh, surprisingly, uh, that results in a huge trade deficit. Our, okay. our fishing industry just simply cannot catch enough seafood uh, to meet demand. And as the world population grows, uh, that demand is increasing at a very rapid rate. Uh, China already consumes more seafood per person per year than we do in the United States, 25 pounds per year compared to 15 pounds in the United States. Uh, Europe consumes about 40 pounds per person, Japan 60 pounds per person. So, uh, you know, the, the world is, is taking seafood out of the ocean uh, faster than the ocean can keep up. You know, Bill, if, if, we, if we just kind of imagine I mean, what would happen if the, the China's consumption of seafood in pounds per person reached the level that Japan is at, at 60 pounds per person? Well, it, it's uh, staggering. I mean, the, uh, right now we take 92 million metric tons of seafood out of the ocean every year. Okay. Uh, now, the good news is that um, farming seafood supplies half of all seafood consumed in the world today. Of that, mean, of that 85 percent that we import, right. half of it is farmed product. Interesting. I, so bet you, I bet you didn't know that, right? Half of everything that's imported is, is, is a farmed product. Boy. So, for example, uh, shrimp, tilapia, catfish, uh, mollusks uh, like oysters and clams, and uh, of course, in, in some countries, eel is a delicacy that's farmed. Yeah, okay. Um, it's a $100 billion industry dominated by China. Let's take one other little aspect of food security so that, uh, you know, the, 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 our viewers here can have the, the total picture, and that is if we take, the, the, um, take our focus away from the local Hawaiian island situation here, and we, we look at... Uh, many of the, the international news incidents that are taking place in, in terms of a, a security or maritime security flashpoints, they are in the South China Sea. And so a piece of that South China Sea, as you know, has to do with oil and gas rights. But another very important piece has to do with food security. That's right. And the statistic, uh, folks, that, that uh, we all know that, uh, or at least Bill and I know, will share with you is that in that area of the South China Sea where we've got China, um, 
in Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Brunei, Malaysia, in that area, Taiwan, Philippines, there are 500 million people that depend upon seafood as their principal source of protein. And, and I mean, and, and that, that demand creates uh, potential military friction. That's right. And the, the Chinese fishing fleet is huge and very aggressive. They fish all over the world. Uh, and uh, fishing as it stands right now is a, is a very tough competitive industry because there are fewer fish in the ocean. Uh, fishing fleets have to go further afield to find fish. And um, quotas and regulatory uh, processes that try and restrict the, the take simply don't work. 20% of all seafood that's caught is caught illegally, meaning over quota, or in somebody else's exclusive economic zone. Okay. And that's particularly the case in Africa. 40% of uh, Africans, the Africa EEZ is uh, being fished out illegally. Now, let me see if I can summarize our discussion here. See if I see if I understand this correctly. What you're saying is that the conventional forms of of uh, fishing that we all know about, uh, there's no way that 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 type of of uh, production if you will, thinking of fishing as, as a production, uh, can come anywhere near the current demand, much less the future demand. It, it, we're, not right. able to, we're not able to produce enough. It's simply not sustainable. I mean, the fact is, is it's, the ocean is the last place that civilization hunts for food. Uh, it, it's sort of silly to think because, as Jacques Cousteau said, uh, uh, farming is what distinguishes civilization from primitive right, uh, right. human beings. Uh, yet we're still behaving like uh, hunter-gatherers when it comes to seafood. And as you noted in the South China Sea, we're you're coming to, you know, to fight over it. That's right. That's right. So, okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you've just joined us, you're watching a special ThinkTech production on why farm fish and what we've done so far I think is kind of try to outline so you, you can you can picture the problem now and so let's shift over let's let's talk about the solution because Bill you and your company uh, I know are part of the solution and so let's leave that to the bottom and so let's let's talk about fish farming uh, and and uh, you know this this broadcast uh, here from the Hawaiian Islands uh, we know from our history that the ancient Hawaiians I mean they had you know pretty amazing engineering and technology with their fish fish ponds uh, to produce, and, and I guess in the current jargon, what is that called, that type of uh, farming? Well, we call it uh, ranching uh, because really what the ancient Hawaiians were able to do is they built these ponds that had an, uh, an inlet, fish came into the ponds, and then they were gated in, and they were essentially fattened and, and uh, grown out to be of uh, good consumable size, uh, and they fed a million people. And it was a very, uh, very interesting approach to fish farming. Now, uh, catch and fatten was introduced by the Japanese in the 80s uh, for bluefin, because they could see the handwriting on the wall and recognize that since bluefin is the top, top uh, predator and the most desired species in Japanese uh, sushi bar, um, they realized that uh, at current rates that the bluefin was a diminishing resource. So they started this concept of going out and catching schools of immature bluefin, putting them in cages in the ocean, and fattening up uh, the fish until they were market size and market ready. Okay, so that, 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 the, the, the relationship between the ancient Hawaiian technology or engineering of, of building, a, building a wall and the, the fish, fish are captured inside of this gated area and the, 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 the ocean flushes through uh, that whole compound. That's right. And then the Japanese technology in the 1980s, is it all that different from the ancient Hawaiians? Not really. Um, the, They're still on shore, right? Yeah. The advantage, well, no, the, the catch and fatten is done out in the ocean with bluefin, uh, whereas the um, ponds were, you know, near shore. 
Uh, but the, the idea was to have a reliable resource. I mean, if you go out and fish today, there's no guarantee that you're going to catch anything. That's right. why they call it fishing, right? That's right. <laughs> um, but if you if and you're luck. able to, it's luck. Luck. Fish, fishermen's right. luck, right? Okay. So, it, but if you um, corral some fish and fatten them until they're good enough or big enough to eat, then you then you have a reliable supply, and and that's that's what it gets at, and that's why. Um, Terrestrial-based fish farming has taken off. That's, oh, that's why a, that's shrimp the on farming. Land, that's on right. land farming. On land farming, and so, for example, places like uh, Malaysia. Malaysia produces a tremendous amount of shrimp for the global market, uh, and their shrimp farms are huge—50,000 uh, acres. Um, uh, you know, uh, are they doing this on on land? On land, but as land becomes more scarce, uh, you can't devote a lot of land to. Uh, farming seafood. Okay. So the the trend that that we're interested in and capitalizing on is to move fish farming from land near shore settings out into the open ocean, because David, we've got a lot of underutilized ocean. Now, people always uh, think you know you, you know we've learned since elementary school that seventy percent. Of the Earth is covered by water. Right, right, okay. But I remember it, that. I remember that right, number. Okay. Right, uh, and yet that number is wrong, Why uh, is that? because the ocean has three dimensions. It's true that seventy percent of the Earth is covered by water in the two-dimensional space. Okay. But if okay. you take into consideration the three dimensions, the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, for example, is sixty-five million square miles at an average depth of 15,000 feet. So when you start looking at depth, then what does the number get to? 20 to 1. It's 20. A, instead of a 2 to 1 ratio, it's a 20 to 1 ratio of ocean water to land. Wow. Now, that means that if out in the open ocean, which is, is virtually a desert, I mean, we've got oil uh, and mineral activities going on, we have transportation, we have recreation, but for the most part, it's just like a desert. So, I mean, but meaning there's plenty of room for other other activities, other activities. To, to coexist. Exactly. Okay. So moving fish farming out into the open ocean is a solution to producing seafood protein in the environment in which the sea the seafood itself the fish are used to living. Uh, so you can produce it organically without the use of chemicals and antibiotics, as is often done in in closed settings or ponds or. Uh, harbors and bays where uh, a lot of seafood is being produced today. Before we go any further, um, Bill, I, I just I want I kind of want to relate something to our viewers so that they can 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 see the difference. Yet, um, uh, last night I happened to be uh, thinking about this program, uh, as you might expect, and and so I went shopping for seafood, and uh, I was at the the cases at uh, the big cases there at Sam's Club. And I noticed there's there, are, so let's just talk about salmon for instance. Okay, we'll get back to get back to your company, right. which and and I noticed that that um, there is a uh, salmon they call ranched salmon, and I guess that means either near shore or onshore type of, of most what the salmon that's called Atlantic salmon is farmed. Okay, and it is farmed in the ocean. I mean, they start out in hatcheries uh, until the salmon smolt, which has become adapted to salt water. Then they're put in net pens in the ocean, typically near shore settings, bays and estuaries okay. where the water's calm and, and where the... Uh, easy to get to. Them. Easy to get to. Okay, okay. And then they're grown out for about two years until they reach market size. Uh, so Chile, Norway, Scotland, Canada... Uh, are all big Atlantic uh, uh, salmon farming nations. I bet you didn't know. I thought Atlantic salmon came from the Atlantic, but you know. Okay, so I'm looking at these two 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 fillets of fish, Fre <coughs> fresh salmon now. So one of them is the Atlantic salmon or, or, or farm, farm salmon. salmon, and the other is a wild salmon. And so I'm looking at these two, and I notice there's a huge color difference between the, the, the ranch right. salmon and the wild salmon. What, when the, the, and the wild one has this real deep blood red color to it. What's, what's, why is that? Well, it's, it's because um, the salmon in the uh, natural environment uh, are eating other fish that um, have what's called astaxanthin, which is, which is essentially a, 
uh, an algae. Okay. And that algae imparts the, the red color okay. into their flesh. Uh, farm salmon, astaxanthin is put into their food uh, so that they look pink. If, if astaxanthin wasn't in the food, the flesh would be white. Uh, and it's a natural substance. It occurs naturally in nature. It just so happens that the wild salmon uh, uh, take it up in the uh, food that they eat. And let me mention to you, too, um, you, of course, we've all heard about ha the situation in the Pacific Northwest where we had a severe depletion of wild salmon because of um, rivers being dammed off and the, the natural breeding grounds for salmon were, uh, were destroyed. So a lot of what people know to be wild salmon have actually been hatchery bred and released into the wild where they go about their natural okay. uh, growth pattern and then of course are caught uh, in the wild. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons that fishery has been restored is the uh, use of farming techniques. You're watching a fascinating discussion. I mean, Bill, this is great. Uh, the, the, the name of this show is Why Farm Fish? And uh, this is a special Think Tech production with uh, Hawaii's Bill Spencer, who is the CEO and president, in case you just joined us, of Hawaii Oceanic Technology, Inc. Um, so let's return now, Bill, to the to the, the technology that your company has developed, and that is uh, something that's 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 a bit unusual, where you're starting to use depth and distance, and 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 really taking this whole uh, fish farming concept way offshore. That's and, right. Uh, maybe we've got a got a picture here we can can show our viewers uh, to kind of kind of kind of start with that. What are we looking <coughs> at here as an example? Well, uh, let me set the stage first. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen is uh, our patented technology that we call the ocean sphere. Okay. And uh, the ocean sphere is a, a buckyball, if you will, a, a, a design of Buckminster Fuller's that is unique in the fact that the bigger you build it, the stronger it gets. That's and, the, the, the geometric design. That's right. Okay. And uh, this, this design um, is 82,000 cubic meters. It's uh, 55 meters in diameter, which is a little more than a half of a football field in, in diameter. And in our case, uh, we plan to farm tunas and the uh, yellowfin and big-eye tuna, and the ocean sphere could hold 20,100-pound tuna. So that's a, th a, a, a thousand um, tons of tuna. It, it, is that a big catch? That's a big haul. That's a big <laughs> haul. Okay. Now, this uh, this structure that we're looking at, um, uh, what 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 is the surface made of? What what are we seeing there? Well, um, we have this is really a very high tech approach to fish farming um, because uh, in order to make fish farming economical and economically sustainable, uh, you need to do it on a very large scale. No okay. pun intended. And uh, the, so uh, since you can take advantage of the three dimensions that we were talking about earlier, okay. uh, we've built this t to be very large. So the, the exoskeleton is made out of uh, a fiberglass, a very strong fiberglass, and the netting that keeps the fish in and the sharks and other predators out is made out of a, a fiber, fiber called Dyneema. Interesting. And Dyneema fiber is stronger than Kevlar. It's actually used in bulletproof vests, helmets, armored vehicles, and, of course, fishnets and, okay. and okay. Uh, fish cages. So that's um, the surface of what we were seeing that's here. That's right. Okay. That's that's, it's a that. netting so that the, the uh, effluent can um, be uh, dissipated by the surrounding ocean environment. And that's another important point about um, farming in the deep ocean. Because in the deep ocean, um, further from shore, you don't have industrial pollutants. In fact, it, it, again, it's a desert-like environment. You've got phytoplanktons and zooplanktons. And so the effluent from the fish actually is food and nutrients for the lowest level of the food chain, the, the phytoplanktons and zooplanktons, which uh, take, the, take the ammonia and nitrates uh, from the effluent as fertilizer, if you will. Interesting. So it becomes a, a very nice um, environmentally sound approach to the problem. And since there, there's very little of those nutrients out there in the first place, by introducing the nutrients, it, it actually helps 
uh, helps the environment, provides more fish for the low-level fish on the food chain. But let me just step back a second and, and um, illustrate why uh, I think this is so important to take this approach we're doing. Okay, okay. And the, f the fact is, I already mentioned that the oceans reach maximum sustainable yield at about 90 million tons of seafood a year. We're already producing about 60 million tons of food by farming and land and near shore. But the UN Food Agriculture Organization, which is an esteemed organization that looks at the global big picture about food supply, they've determined that by the time world population reaches 9 billion people, that okay. we're going to need at least another 60 million tons of seafood a year. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see if I get these numbers straight. 90 million is the total production? The total that's taken out of the ocean 90, on an annual basis. 90 million. And of that 90, 60... Now there's, on top of that, oh, the, oh, another of, 60, oh, on top of that. Okay. 60 million. So if you look at the, the total, almost half of all seafood consumed, one and a half, um, 150 million tons, uh, 62 million of that is farmed. Good Lord. So the United Nations number for, for s sustainability in terms of being able to feed people in the years to come, that, that, that combined number needs to approach 200 million tons, or we need to farm another 60 million tons. We need to double the current farming rate. Right, because the, the ocean isn't going to produce it. In fact, certain species in the ocean are in severe decline, like bluefin tuna, big-eye tuna, yellowfin tuna, Wow. the Patagonian toothfish known as Chilean sea bass, cod, Atlantic cod, severely distressed, um, swordfish. Uh, there's just a, a number of popular species that are... Uh, that are going to be extinct if we if we don't start farming more. Wow! And so, um, with our technology, uh, we're in a position to farm the kind of seafood that people love to eat, like tunas, like big pelagic species, like groupers, like cod, um, and and diversify the uh, the types of farm product that's out there in the world. Well, let's take let's see if we've got another uh, another picture that we can show our uh, audience here. Oh, we've got a... Well, this, this is, is a close-up, close up. yeah, okay, that so gives you a, a sense of scale. That's a diver there uh, peering into the, the cage. Uh, these cage, cages are designed to be submerged 60 feet below the surface, so they're not affected by surface wind and waves and, and water. So some ship could just go buzz right over top of that. No right, but uh, as, as the uh, fish farming in the ocean evolves, uh, there will be either zones that are going to okay. be designated for uh, farming activity. Uh, and, of course, our Coast Guard uh, has already anticipated that this will become an industry that will require either special zones or special okay. Okay. Uh, markings on nautical charts uh, so that uh, the fish farming areas can be avoided. We will also have uh, attached to this as a topside buoy, which is actually a feeder buoy, and that feeder buoy, the one we're using, holds 100 tons of uh, fish meal. 100 tons? You've got to feed these fish. And uh, it automatically dispenses it and uh, essentially re results in a, a very significant labor reduction because what we're trying to do is automate as much of this as possible. Even the spheres themselves are designed to stay in geostationary position. Uh, using GPS and telecommunications, the latest technology that's already being used in the oil industry, for example. Well, well, just so that the, the viewer can appreciate this, Bill, how, how far offshore, it's 60, 60 feet under the surface, but how far offshore is this, is this cage going to be located? Well, um, every country has... Did a, I use the right word? Is it a cage? Well, the ocean sphere. We ocean like to call sphere. it ocean sphere, okay. but yeah, it's a cage. All um, right. The... Uh, Ocean Sphere is designed to operate out in, in deep water, so uh, every country has a 200-mile exclusive economic zone. So if we're going to do farming in, in our EEZ, you could be right. out 50 miles, 100 miles, 150 miles, whatever makes practical sense. You know, we've got, once you get offshore here in the Hawaiian Islands, we've got some serious depth out yeah, there. Our, actually, our economic, uh, exclusive economic zone, EEZ, is 200,000 square miles. It's the second uh, largest Jeez. in the United States uh, next to Alaska. Well, but where, 
Okay. Our site, we've actually, what we've been doing the last five years is going through the regulatory process that allows us to actually lease an ocean column in Hawaiian waters. So, uh, lease we ha that's right. an ocean column. column. That's right. We have a, a square kilometer that goes from the surface of the ocean all the way down to the bottom at 1,320 feet. And, and this, this square kilometer at 1,320 feet in depth, where is this located? We're 2.6 miles off of the North Kohala coast, okay. about seven miles uh, north-northwest from Kauai High Harbor. So and out quite a ways. Well, we're out, we're out a ways. Um, we're uh, still within state territorial waters because, interestingly, Hawaii is the only state in the United States, aside from Maine, okay. that has a... Uh, ocean lease law that allows you to lease an ocean column to do aquaculture or mariculture. Is it no, is this, is this uh, a, 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 a first in terms of new technology for fish, fish farming, this whole concept that your company is doing? Well, that's why, our, uh, why we met the standard of the U.S. Patent we'll, we'll Office. Get, we'll but, get to that, but, I, but um, I'm just the big picture for our listeners is this is something very, very new, right? We're, we will be the first to have an untethered, uh, self-positioned uh, fish cage. It's untethered. Untethered. It's well, not well, tethered to the ocean floor. How, uh, what makes it stay there? It doesn't just flow with the current. Well, you don't see this in the illustration, but we have thrusters uh, at 90 degrees, at, uh, four thrusters around the perimeter of the ocean sphere that are much like bow thrusters on cruise ships that allow a cruise ship to turn around uh, without the aid of a, a tugboat. And these thrusters are um, uh, controlled by a sophisticated command and control system, much like the military uh, uses to control unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned underwater vehicles. Interesting. Boy, you've got to admit, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is something that's really fascinating. And I'm not sure, but um, uh, let, me, let me ask our producer, do we have another photograph that we should be showing our, our viewers here? And if so, let's, let's take a look at that. Oh, okay. Now this is this is what we call a flotilla, uh, which is another part of our our concept. Because, um, as I mentioned earlier, to do this with uh, economic viability, you you need to be able to scale the farming operation okay. up. Okay. And our our lease site off of North Kohala on the Big Island is permitted for twelve ocean spheres. This this is the first in the world of this type of okay. of thing. I mean, there there are. Uh, Nearshore tethered systems that could have many nets associated with them, net pens, but the biggest ones are about uh, 20,000 or 40,000 cubic meters. So ours is twice as big as the biggest tethered net pen. And the reason we don't want to tether it is because it's first very expensive to tether sure. something in deep water, and secondly, when you when you're tethered, uh, you you know the currents put a much more stress on the uh, structure. When you're not tethered, you can wiggle around a little bit and uh, ebb and flow. Uh, that ebb kind and flow. And, okay. and the other thing is that some jurisdictions like you to fallow your uh, site every year. So after you have a harvest, you have to stop farming fish for a year. Well, that to a farmer, you know, uh, who doesn't ha have a lot of land to move, move its field okay. over, uh, that can be a challenge. In our scenario, you can actually just move our equipment to another location and and start farming a different location. So, so to 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 complete the picture here, um, ladies and gentlemen, what you're looking at is uh, these ocean spheres or uh, cages that are used, uh, uh, made out of uh, kind of a Kevlar-like netting That's with right. a, with a fiberglass structure, and these are uh, two plus miles offshore in. 1,300 feet of water, That's right. six, 60 feet below the surface. And the interesting thing that you should know is this brand spanking new technology, which I'd like to call the iPhone 5 of fish farming, <laughs> Okay, um, is, is uh, this is a, a, or something really new and very unique in the, unique in the world here. And so what, what is fascinating to me is the technology with the uh, GPS system and thrusters to maintain uh, the, the location of these ocean spheres, Bill, in a, in, a, 
and when you think about it, I mean, it's it, the technology is is very similar to uh, what you would see in a, a uh, in the uh, I hate to use the word old, but it's true. Uh, NASA manned spacecraft to, to oh, yeah. maneuver in space. You use the thrusters. The to same, anchor. actually, uh, the most relevant uh, example in today's world is a modern day oil drilling platform. Because as you know, uh, we're searching for oil in the ocean all over the world, and some of those, drill, some of those uh, oil sites are um, 10,000 feet below the surface. And to drill those, you can't build a, a, a drilling rig that's, that's you know, stuck in 10,000 right, feet. Right. So what you have is you have a, a boat, if you will, a platform that uh, has a drill on it. And that platform is kept on position uh, with thrusters and GPS. Fascinating. It's the same technology. We're just repurposing it to fish for it. And the flotilla concept, which is important, is because... To produce 62 million tons of seafood out in the ocean, just think about that. Each one of those globes is a thousand tons, so uh, we're talking about a, a lot, a lot of capacity that needs to be built up in the next 20 years to do this. So, imagine a flotilla of okay. ocean spheres, a hundred miles out in the ocean, that maybe has a thousand ocean spheres. Okay, okay, I'm with you. That would be enough to produce what a million tons, right? Right. Um, and and that would have a, a, a tender ship with a feed mill on it. Okay. It's producing feed. It would have crew quarters. And it would basically be modern-day um, farming in the open ocean. Just like, uh, you know, a, a, a major uh, uh, agricultural operation that we right. might see in Central California right. or in the Midwest. Exactly. Someplace. But here's the most interesting part of this. Our lease site... Uh, is a square kilometer, which is 247 acres. Okay. And uh, once we're up to full production with six of these ocean spheres harvesting a year, okay. that means 6,000 tons of, of ahi tuna being produced a year, to take the same amount of beef and produce 6,000 tons of beef protein, you need 21,000 acres of land. Versus? 247 acres. Wow. 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 And, of course, you need fresh water for the cattle. Absolutely. The fish don't need fresh water. The other thing that's important for your viewers to understand is producing seafood protein is very efficient. It takes seven pounds of grain or grass to produce a pound of beef. Okay, se se seven, seven to one. Four to one for pigs and lamb. Okay. Uh, three to one for chickens. Okay. Fish farming is achieving one-to-one -one food conversion ratios. So in terms of the production of Boy, it's protein, really efficient. It's incredibly efficient. Wow. Now people worry about, well, you're, you know, you're using um, smaller fish like sardines to create more valuable fish like tuna. Okay. Well, the fact is that sardines are algae eaters. They grow quickly. They procreate, you know, like rabbits. And because our oceans are being so severely depleted of top-level predators, there actually are many more sardines out there uh, than people realize. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely sustainable resource. Already, 65% of low troposphere fish, like sardines, are used for terrestrial feed and for cat feed and for production of omega-3 uh, fish oil that people take as nutraceuticals. Incredible. Uh, so it's it's a very resilient resource that's that's quite sustainable, um, and of course, uh, other sources of feed, um, uh, even even vegetable protein or algal protein, can be used as an alternative. You know, this is uh, just just almost mind blowing technology and uh, uh, the, the the value to mankind so so significant. Um, and uh, how, how long has your company been at this? Well, uh, we started in July 2006, and uh, we have gone through an incredible permitting process, which I'm honored to have survived. 
uh, because we've been held to a very, very high standard in order to get the right to do our business. But well, let's get into that in a moment. Uh, but before we get into the whole permitting process, I, I know this has been a, a long, arduous journey. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, there I, th I think there's some good news at the end of this, <laughs> at the end of this program. But, but um, you're, we'll come back to the permitting next, but, but I think uh, what, what I'm most interested in next is that there, as you develop this technology and started to roll forward, um, has there been some opposition to what you've been doing here in Hawaii? Well, um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation and misunderstanding about uh, fish farming. Uh, Why is that? Well, uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is, is this is a very new field and, you know, uh, a lot of people um, haven't been educated about the importance of it as well as as the technology and the advances that have been made. Another concern uh, that uh, people have is, is they don't understand oceanography. They don't understand how the ocean works. And so, for example, they think that, you know, that fish poop is bad for the ocean. Uh, but when, they, in fact, it's a good thing. When it's a, a good thing. And they, they don't understand the ocean's capacity to mineralize uh, the natural effluent uh, okay. that comes from the, uh, the farming process. Uh, of course, um, other people don't like to see fish farms in their view plane. You know, they, uh, uh, they want to have a beautiful view and well, I, hence... I don't, I don't uh, understand. How, how, could you, how, could you, how can you even see this? It's well, 60 feet below it's the surface. It's submerged and it's uh, almost three miles offshore and, and uh, it's, it's at best a, a speck uh, in the ocean. Uh, but if, you know, that's my point. And the whole reason for taking this further out, 50 miles out, is then it's not in anybody's viewplane. Uh, but there are forces in, the, in, the, in our society that, you know, adopt um, uh, stances against things. Uh, in order to raise money to keep their okay. organizations uh, okay. alive. And uh, so they'll promulgate... Uh, Generate a cause. Uh, yeah, a cause. And, and they'll promulgate all sorts of uh, misinformation to rally the troops and fill their coffers with uh, donations. So in, in our case, an organization in Washington, D.C. Uh, has funded uh, numerous activist groups around the state to uh, attack our, our endeavor. Okay. Uh, they, you know, they, they're the same organization that uh, attacks companies that uh, bottle water or that um, are in the, in the coffee business, okay. for example, okay. because they, they don't like greedy corporations using a public resource to make a profit. Okay. Or at least that's their... Uh, that's their perception. Their perception, okay. and that's how they're able to raise money to keep their organizations going. This, uh, talk about, talking about opposition now to to your development of new technology and, and I guess that's that's kind of goes with the territory if you will um, what about I'm very curious to know if you have if you had opposition from the the traditional fishing community as somehow this is going to take uh, right away from their table I mean well uh, yes and no I, I mean I, I should tell your viewers that 90% of the people out there uh, really love what we're doing because they're tired of paying high prices of, uh, for seafood. They, they like to uh, see more ready supply. They know it's healthy. They, they enjoy it. Um, so they're definitely supportive of what we're doing. Um, we've been very careful with the local seafood industry to not, um, and, and we promise not to flood the market with product. Uh, but the fact is, you talk to any fisherman, and it's, it's not a bountiful ocean in the waters around Hawaii. Not anymore, at least. Um, you know, and, and as it stands, we only consume in Hawaii 3,000 tons of uh, sashimi-grade uh, yellowfin and big-eye tuna a year. 1,000 tons of that is just over the New Year's holidays. Uh, when the tuna prices tend to really get up. That's right, up they go through the roof. 75% of all the seafood we land in, in Hawaii is actually uh, sent to the mainland or exported to Japan. Uh, and we continue to import 85% of the seafood we eat right here in Hawaii. Uh, so, um, you know, so I, I think the ability to get a consistent supply, a very fresh product, 
that hasn't been in the hold of a boat for three weeks, you know, that's basically harvested right in our own pure Hawaiian sure. waters is a, a desirable thing. Wow. Well, let's go back now to the, the topic that we started on just a little bit. Let's okay. talk about the, the, the kind of the incredible gauntlet of regulatory challenges that you and your company have been put through. And I know you made the comment earlier that, that you were very pleased to be held to such a high standard and to have met such a high standard. Um, but probably if I pushed you hard enough, you would not say that you would be pleased to run that gauntlet. You know? Well, I, you know, I, I think there's sort of a, a disconnect with the, uh, the regulatory process and the business world. You know, we hear politicians all the time talk about how innovation and entrepreneurship is the key to uh, improving our economy. And that's okay. what America is all about. Right. But um, at the same time, our legislators have, uh, have bent over backwards to impose regulations uh, to calm the concerns of constituents, constituents yeah. right. uh, and the loudest ones and the ones that, that make the most noise on Capitol Hill and in the state houses are the environmental activists. Uh, so um, the bar is set very high for folks trying to do things that involve the environment um, to satisfy these concerns. It's, it's called the precautionary principle. Okay. Especially when you're doing something new that hasn't been done before. Then the microscope is on and they want you to answer questions that, frankly, you can't answer until you actually do it. And uh, so that's what we've earned the right to do. We've had to do an environmental impact statement. Okay. And, uh, and where did that come out? Just so our viewers know. Well, um, that was a f the first thing we did was a, an EIS uh, and a cultural assessment, which was required to get what's called a conservation district use permit. The state manages our near shore waters because they're essentially uh, ceded lands out okay. to three miles. Okay. And in order to get our lease, we had to get a conservation district use permit. All right. So then once the lease was granted, then we had to interface with the federal government to get what's called a, um, a federal consistency review. And that is my favorite permit. That's the permit <laughs> that made sure that we got all the permits we're supposed to get. The permit to make sure you get all the that's permits. That's right. That's why that's my favorite permit. And then we had to get an okay. EPA, uh, Federal Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit, which uh, is one that made us demonstrate that the quantity and content of the effluent from, would it, these, from the, uh, the, ocean sphere. the ocean spheres, from the farming process, would in fact be mineralized within the ocean column that we're operating so that we're not, in effect, polluting the water. They're allowing us to have the effluent so long as uh, we can demonstrate that it won't uh, pollute And the so you had to go through this process to, 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 to prove by scientific tests and, and uh, Yes, and then, the, that then they've imposed upon us uh, a long list of monitoring and uh, uh, testing requirements. For example, the EPA permit is going to require us to uh, test the water around our, our cages on a monthly basis. They want us to test the bottom of the ocean at 1,300 feet on a quarterly basis, um, f you know, to see if, well, is there anything that actually is going to um, touch the bottom, which okay. uh, science and, and logic dictate will never happen. But nonetheless, we have to you know, uh, to accommodate their yeah. monitoring uh, requests, okay. which are going to be very expensive, and it's going to increase the cost of our operations and and increase the cost of the food we produce. Um, and then finally, our, our final permit, which is uh, the Army Corps Engine of Engineers Section 10 permit, which is essentially required because we are an obstruction in the ocean, and uh, the Army Corps has to satisfy the National Marine Fisheries Service, Protected Species Division, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the State Health Planning uh, Department, that uh, our obstruction isn't going to be a, a problem. Okay, now where, where you, you, you describe this, this kind of mind-numbing morass of uh, environmental laws and procedures and permits that, that just like a... a uh, 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 for our viewers, it's just like a, uh, an incredible bamboo thicket you got to get through right. all that. Uh, 
And uh, where are you now in this, th this whole process? H how far away are we from the actually seeing the ocean spheres out there? Well, you know, after five and a half years, we're uh, within a month of, of uh, having our Army Corps permit issue, and uh, then we're ready to actually execute our business plan. <laughs> okay. So when the Army Corps of Engineers gives that final approval, That's right. then what happens? Then we're going to build our first ocean sphere. Uh, Is it, that built here in Hawaii? For the most part, the certain components are manufactured elsewhere, but the actual uh, exoskeleton um, will uh, be built here, it'll be assembled here, and then it'll be um, t taken out to our ocean site where we'll start testing it and uh, making sure all the systems operate properly. And at that point, which will be about 18 months from start, we'll introduce the tuna that we've been working on breeding in captivity uh, into the ocean sphere, and then they will grow out to harvest weight in about 18 months. So do you, do you I'm curious, do you, do you have uh, your breeder fish already? That's right. We, we've been uh, allowed the opportunity to collect essentially a, a small number of uh, baby ahi, which okay. we have, have in a very um, sophisticated holding tank. And where, where are they now? Uh, they're over in the Natural Energy Lab on the uh, Big Island. Okay. And those fish have been growing out to uh, essentially spawning age, which is about 40 pounds. And uh, right now it's uh, tuna season in Hawaii. It's yellowfin tuna season, and we're expecting them to start spawning any day now. Okay. And so you, the, so the, these breeder fish that will be introduced into the ocean cages are, are, are at about the 40, 50 pound? Well, what, what they do, when the tuna spawn, they spawn about 3 million eggs. And then about 5% of those will become fertilized. Okay. In the wild, it's less than a half a percent, but we think in, in captivity we'll have a higher fertilization rate. Then those fertilized eggs will be fed the same kind of uh, feeds that they get in the natural environment uh, and, and grown up for about um, 30 days and then weaned onto a, a fish meal. Okay. Uh, and then those fish, once they're the right size, then they'll be taken out to the uh, ocean spheres at our lease site and allowed to grow out from there. So the fish that come from our hatchery, we like to say egg to plate, but the hatchery bred <laughs> fish um, are, are going to be trained to expect two square meals a day, unlike okay. wild tuna which are used to scavenging around and hunting for their food, which, uh, surprisingly, they require 10 pounds of bait fish for every pound of growth. And the fish that they eat have eaten fish all the way down the food chain. Okay. So okay. Uh, they, in the wild, a tuna has actually uh, has about a 100 to 1 food conversion ratio. It's not as even as efficient as uh, growing cattle. <laughs> not at all. And that's, that's sort of the irony of well, why are we still, you know, fishing instead of farming. Right. Um, it, it, just, uh, it just doesn't make sense Incredible. when you really, uh, uh, when you think about it. And that's why you need to farm fish. Okay. And that happens to be the title of our program. You're watching the special Think Tech production here called Why Farm Fish? We have uh, Mr. Bill Spencer, who is the uh, president and CEO of Hawaii Oceanic Technology, Inc., and I'm your host, David Day. And uh, I guess, Bill, we're looking at, uh, what did you say, five months or so to the uh, uh, final, final piece in the regulatory thicket? Well, we, we actually expect sooner than that we should have our, our permit. Um, and then we get, get on with the business of uh, deploying an ocean sphere. So from where we sit today until I can go to... Oshiro or, or, or <laughs> right. Tamashiro's market and, and and get one of the the uh, Hawaii Ocean Technology ahi. We're calling them king ahi. King, okay, the, the king, king ahi. King ahis. Um, uh, we're looking at about from today three and a half years, something like that. Roughly three years, yeah, three and three and a half years. And so to add on to this piece, if I if I back up in the timetable, this this development of this technology and then your, your uh, 
dancing to, or fighting through the regulatory thicket, depending right. on the term that you want, right. that that puts us at a at a at a at an eight year timeline in order to go from near conception right. or from from really from concept to proof of concept. Uh, once we have our first harvest, then we'll we'll have gone full cycle. Uh, but after that, we'll we'll be of course putting more ocean spheres in the water, um, and then selling the technology or licensing the technology around the world. Uh, the United States uh, actually doesn't have a, for for our own territorial waters a regulatory infrastructure yet that would allow a uh, entrepreneur to start farming fish in our EEZ. Uh, and that's going to take probably three to five years before there are uh, good regulations. In, in, a, in other words, in a, to break out of the, the state of Hawaii, to go to, for instance, uh, offshore Washington, California, or California, or Florida, or okay. anywhere uh, in our exclusive economic zone. So the, 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 if I understand what you're saying correctly, is the, the only, uh, legally, the only uh, location in the United States where this technology could be started is here in, in the Hawaiian Islands? Essentially. Is or, that, is that or right? Maine. Uh, there's salmon farming done in Maine. It's uh, m much more um, routine there, but it's it's not as big uh, an industry as, say, Chile or, or Norway or Scotland. Uh, but Hawaii has an in incredible opportunity, if you ask me, to, to actually uh, embrace this uh, opportunity to farm seafood in the sure. open ocean. Because, as I said, we have a 200,000 square mile exclusive economic zone. We have non-industrialized waters, so the, uh, there's no pollution um, right, right. that could affect fish health or require uh, the fish to have to take antibiotics. Um, we have an incredible opportunity to be, you know, the, the bread basket of seafood, if you sure. will. Sure, no, 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 I understand, uh, and, I understand what you're saying. And generate tremendous amount of, of revenues, which means tax revenues to the state. And, and that's, why, that's why Hawaii has this regulation because, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, state legislators realized that we had a strate strategic competitive advantage if we allowed uh, aquaculture in our waters. And so that's, that was really the reason they um, came up with the idea to allow uh, aquaculture in our territorial waters. You know, Bill, as we, we've, we've uh, had this discussion here this evening, and, and uh, we go back to the kind of the beginning of our program here. We were talking about the whole issue of, of food security and the, the uh, national or the, the, the national friction that this food security problem or, or the, the, the drive to have enough food to eat, to have enough protein is already causing in the world. It's interesting when you, you think about the real big picture that what you're talking about is one of the... Um, one of the, the, the key building blocks for uh, regional stability in terms of uh, uh, security uh, and uh, uh, eliminating these types of, of uh, flashpoints like Absolutely. we see in the South China Sea. So that, that you know, the, I guess the point that I kind of want to, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but this, this technology that you and your company have developed, I mean, it, this is actually a, um, uh, a a component for for peace in in throughout the world. It absolutely is, and in fact, I've thought about that a lot because, you know, when you what are the scarce resources that we we've already fighting about is oil, right? We already absolutely. fight over oil. Absolutely, uh, f food, land, and and water yeah. are are right behind. That's right, and uh, it takes land to produce food. Um, we're already fighting over fishing rights in the South China Sea, um, not our countries, but the countries you pointed out. And so it's only natural that, that we come up with a way to, to civilize uh, seafood production by farming it. And that's really, uh, as an entrepreneur, that's the vision that I've um, had all along for this company, is that... Uh, we can solve a huge problem, which is how to produce f enough food to feed the world and calm those nations that are already fighting over 
the scarce resource that's that's, that's true found because, in the that's wild. That's absolutely true because you 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 have created the solution here, and uh, certainly a solution. And yeah. uh, you know, are, are, let me. We're we're almost out of time here. I'm just I'm very curious. Are there um, uh, potential uh, countries or investors that 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 have seen you starting to to come through this regulatory thicket and, and uh, about ready to, to get this whole process underway that have approached you that express some kind of interest? Absolutely. We have a, a variety of strategic investors. We have uh, um, people in the food business and the protein business uh, all over the world that are anxious to uh, have us prove our concept. Well, and, I'm not going to uh, let you go and, and <laughs> give away any secrets yet. So the answer to my question is yes. Yeah. And uh, we're just about out of time here. I just want to uh, thank you, Bill. My and, pleasure. Uh, for Think Tech, thank you for joining us on uh, this wonderful program, very educational. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Thank you.